Yeah, that clock keeps ticking till we start up in here. Yeah, that clock keeps ticking till we start up in here. If you came to learn chemistry, you did your part. Time is ticking down, so just be ready, cause it's about to start. When we solve it for problems, we solve it information. You know Ben's can videos will provide you with equations. Never have to stop and think about it, this is station. That will provide you with the chemistry all in relation. If you came to learn chemistry, Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Ben's Chem Videos Sunday Night Live Stream. Tonight, we are going to continue our discussion on electrochemistry. Very, very excited about that. I think it's going to be a great show. And so without further ado, I present to you Electrochemistry Volume 4. Your feedback is super, super important to me. So if you're watching this live, please let me know what you think in the chat. And if you're watching this in the form of a video, please feel free to leave me a comment because I really, really value your feedback. And one thing in particular that I would like your feedback on is the audio. Um, I've recently tried to tweak my microphone settings to improve my audio. So let me know if it sounds better or if it sounds worse. Basically, what it comes down to is <clears throat> I have this laptop. I'm streaming from a laptop and it, it, it gets really loud. The computer fan is really, really loud. And I'd like one day to be able to save up enough money to get a PC, you know, like a actual desktop PC that I can put under my desk that's whisper quiet. Um, but for now, I kind of have to make do with the equipment that I have. So would really, really appreciate your feedback on the audio uh, as we go forward. So, all right. So as usual with these streams, uh, I like to begin them by briefly reviewing the content from the previous stream. So that was Electrochemistry Volume 3. So we're going to review what we talked about last week in volume three. So in volume three, right, we talked about electrode potentials or half cell potentials, right? So we know that when you connect two electrodes together, an anode and a cathode, right, you get electric current, you get the flow of electrons, the flow of electric charge. And that flow of electric charge is driven by a difference in potential energy that we conveniently call potential difference. It's also called cell potential if you're talking about a voltaic cell, right? So there's a difference in pot potential energy that drives the flow of electrons within a voltaic cell or galvanic cell, whichever you prefer to call it. And what we talked about in volume three is that each half cell, each electrode within a voltaic cell can be thought of as having its very own potential, its very own <clears throat> expression of what the potential energy of an electron is within that particular electrode, right? And the problem with measuring the individual potentials of half cells or of electrodes is that you don't really get a reading, right? You don't really get a, a reading of potential unless you have two half cells connected together to make a full cell, right? And so the way that we solve that problem is by assigning a value of zero to a particular type of half cell so that we can measure the potentials of all other half cells relative to that zero. And the particular type of half cell, the particular type of electrode that we assign the value of zero to <clears throat> is called the standard hydrogen electrode. And it is shown in this image right here. So standard hydrogen electrode or SHE, it's composed of an inert platinum electrode submerged in a one molar solution of H plus ions, usually from HCl or something like that. So like one molar HCl. And you have hydrogen gas at one atmosphere bubbling through the solution. And if the standard hydrogen electrode is acting as your cathode, then the reduction half reaction associated with that process is shown down here where we have two H pluses and two electrons coming together, uh, being reduced to just plain old hydrogen. And so we assign a, a value of zero volts uh, to that particular electrode. So now that we have that value of zero, anything that we hook the standard hydrogen electrode to, uh, whatever we hook that up to, we can measure the, the half cell potential, the electrode potential of any electrode uh, that we choose, right? And so that led us to take a look at the table of standard electrode potentials. So I think I'll go ahead and click away from here for just a moment so that we can uh, take a look at that table, right? So this is what it looks like. So by convention, the uh, half reactions are written for reduction. Only the reduction half reactions are shown. And this table shows those reduction half reactions along with their corresponding values of their electrode potentials in volts, 
right? And so this table is organized such that such that the strongest oxidizing agents appear at the top. So basically, this is organized in decreasing potential energy order from top to bottom. The substances at the top of this table have a really, really strong tendency to undergo reduction, right? And the substances at the bottom of the table have a really, really weak tendency to undergo reduction. They really, really suck at being oxidizing agents. But the substances on the right-hand side, those substances at the bottom of the table tend to be really, really strong uh, reducing agents. And so it sort of works like that, right? So we took a look at this table, and uh, I'm going to go back uh, to the PowerPoint real quick just to uh, continue this. So basically, right, we look, what does that say? <laughs> Roberto, he says, I came, love, sorry. Okay, uh, I accept. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means, but thank you for being here, Roberto. Appreciate it. I came late. Ah, okay. No worries, man. Hey, better late than never. I'm just happy to have people in here, dude. So yeah, come on in, dude. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. So, all right. So we looked at that table of standard electrode potentials, right? And we learned how to calculate the cell potential by using tabulated values of standard electrode potentials, right? So this E cell thing with the little degree sign up there, that is the standard cell potential. And we can, again, we can calculate that using tabulated values of standard electrode potentials. And there's a formula, you know, to be honest, I probably should have displayed that formula here on this slide, uh, but there is a formula. I'll just take you to the whiteboard and, uh, and show you the formula. So the formula uh, that'll let you calculate the value of your standard cell potential or E cell is simply that E cell is equal to the electrode potential of your cathode minus the standard electrode potential of your anode, right? And so once you look up those tabulated values for those <clears throat> electrode potentials, you plug them into this formula here and bingo, bango, bongo, you have the standard cell potential for your voltaic cell, right? It's literally that easy. Plug them into that formula and presto. Let me uh, take you guys back to the PowerPoint here. So that is what we talked about. We also talked about how to use that table of standard electrode potentials to predict the direction of spontaneity of a redox reaction. So there really, there's one of two possibilities with a redox reaction. Either it is spontaneous or non-spontaneous as written. If it's spontaneous, then that means that the Ford reaction occurs spontaneously and you have a positive value for your standard, uh, uh, standard cell potential, right? Now, if it's not spontaneous as written, then that means that the reverse of that redox reaction is spontaneous, right? So that's very, very important to understand. And if I'll, uh, let me take you back to that table just for uh, a moment so we can uh, visualize this better. We also talked about, again, this trick that you can use with this table in order to predict whether your redox reaction is spontaneous or not is to understand that any reduction half reaction shown in this table will be spontaneous if it is paired with the reverse of a reduction half reaction that appears below it in the table. So if I identify my redu reduction half reaction, if the oxidation half reaction in that cell is the reverse of a reduction half reaction that appears below my actual reduction half reaction in the table, then I will have a positive value of the cell potential, the standard cell potential, and that will indicate a spontaneous redox reaction. So let's go ahead and go back the PowerPoint and we will continue forward. So yeah, that was basically all that we talked about in volume three. And so uh, we're going to move on and talk about tonight's material. So what are we going to do uh, tonight? So tonight, what I thought we would do is I thought we would basically just do some practice, right? What I want to do tonight is I want to do a few problems in which we apply the knowledge, the concepts that we've discussed over the course of the last couple of live streams going back to the beginning of this uh, electrochemistry live stream series. By the way, if you wanna watch any of the previous episodes in this live stream series, you need look no further than the description of this video where I've provided a link to a playlist that's called Electrochemistry Live Streams. You can watch volume one, two, three, or, and also when this is eventually produced, volume four will be in that playlist as well, and all of the ones in the future to come. So that playlist is where you would go to find. So basically, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna 
teach this content, I'm going to go over these examples as if you've watched those three episodes, right? If you haven't watched those three episodes, then you might get a little lost. But again, you just, all you need to do is just look up that playlist link in the description, and that will uh, bring you up to speed. So one thing that I've sort of been criticized on over the years is that I will introduce a concept, right? And then I will do like one or two practice problems, and then I'll move on to another concept, right? So I've been criticized for not doing enough a practice sort of in between. And so to address that criticism, uh, we're going to do some practice where we're going to sketch some voltaic cells. So that's what we're doing. We are sketching some voltaic cells. I hope that you are as excited as I am because it's about to get crazy. Well, not crazy, but it's about to get technical, complicated. So, all right, so let's go through the first problem and we're going to read the instructions and we are going to solve it. So this problem says to... <clears throat> Predict whether the following redox reaction is spontaneous. And then it says, sketch the electrochemical cell in which the spontaneous reaction would occur. So basically what that means is if the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction, then we would write the voltaic cell, or we would sketch the voltaic cell associated with that process. But if the forward reaction is not spontaneous, then that means the reverse reaction is spontaneous. And so we would sketch a voltaic cell associated with the reverse of the reaction, again, if it's non-spontaneous. So <clears throat> that's what that means. And then it says to assume standard conditions. So that last part is pretty important, right? Because if it's not under standard conditions, then we can't really use any tabulated values of standard electrode potentials and, and things like that. So the <clears throat> equation for the redox reaction is this one right here, where we have manganese reacting with nickel 2 plus ion, produce manganese 2 plus ion, and just plain nickel, right? So what I'm going to do, as usual, is I'm just going to copy and paste this problem uh, into the whiteboard. Started hacking this problem. By the way, if anybody is in here and would like to comment on the audio, I would, uh, I would certainly appreciate it. So let's go to the whiteboard. So we're going to paste this problem. Oop, didn't mean to do that. Paste this problem here. Make it a little bit bigger. I think that's pretty good. All right, so here it is, right? So we're trying to sketch the voltaic cell or galvanic cell that is associated with whichever one of these reactions, either the forward or the reverse reaction, happens to be spontaneous. So the first step is to figure out whether this reaction is spontaneous, right? And in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to identify what our oxidation and reduction half reactions are going to be. In other words, we need to identify what is being oxidized and what is being reduced, and write out those associated half reaction equations. Rohan Kumar says audio sounds pretty good. Awesome. Thank you for your feedback. Again, I don't think it'll sound great until I get rid of this laptop and replace it with a nice whisper quiet PC, a desktop PC. But um, again, I'll, I'll, like I said, I got to do what I can with the equipment that I have. All right. So again, we're going to write out and identify the oxidation and the reduction half reaction associated with this redox reaction, right? And so what's being oxidized here? What's losing electrons? Well, it looks to me like the manganese is losing electrons because it goes from a neutral manganese atom to a manganese ion that has lost two electrons, that has acquired a positive two charge, right? And so my oxidation half reaction is going to be the following, where we have just plain old manganese yields the manganese two plus ion <clears throat> and two electrons. So that's my oxidation half reaction. My reduction half reaction, well, if manganese is the stuff that's being oxidized, then that means that the nickel ion must be the stuff that's being reduced. So that means my reduction half reaction is going to be Ni two plus plus two electrons equals yields uh, just plain old nickel, right? So now now that we have identified what our oxidation and our reduction half reactions are, we can refer to the table of standard electrode potentials. And remember that rule? Any reduction half reaction will be spontaneous when it's paired with the reverse of a reduction half reaction that lies below it in the table. Well, let's put that to the test and see if that applies to this particular half cell, right? So our reduction is going to be the reduction of nickel ion. Oxidation is going to be the oxidation of manganese. 
So let's remember that as we uh, as we go through the table here. So here we go. So the table here. So it's the reduction of I already forgot. <laughs> so it's the reduction of nickel ion and the oxidation of manganese. So let's see if we can find the reduction of nickel ion anywhere in this table. Where is it? Here it is, right here. So we have the reduction of nickel ion. Let's see if I can zoom in on this a little bit. I just had it, so it's right here. I'm gonna scroll. So here we go, right here where my mouse cursor is. That's the reduction of nickel ion. So really the question becomes, does the reduction of manganese ion appear below this in the table? And it looks like it does, right? I can see right here, here's the reduction of manganese ion. That's below the reduction of nickel ion. And since any reduction half reaction is going to be spontaneous when it's paired with the reverse of a reduction half reaction that appears below it in the table of standard electrode potentials, then that means that, yeah, this is going to be spontaneous, right? It'll be spontaneous as written. It'll be spontaneous in the forward direction. It'll have a positive value for standard cell potential, right? So I'm just going to, uh, big purple letters, I'm just going to say appear. Yes, <laughs> it is spontaneous, right? And so now we get to do the fun part, right? We get to sketch out the voltaic cell associated with these two half reactions, right? And so what is that going to look like? So basically what I'm going to do, and again, I would really, really encourage you to follow along with this. I really think that drawing these out yourself dramatically improves your understanding of this material, right? I don't recommend just like watching in a in a passive way. I think you know, in order, if you really really want to understand this stuff better, you need to take an active approach. You need to actually you know use your hand and a pen, piece of paper, and draw these things out yourself. It'll go a long way to help your brain sort of remember the content. So all right, so I'm going to basically draw out my two half cells. I'm just going to start uh, by drawing like two beakers, basically. Right, we have two beakers. These are our two uh, half cells. Right. And remember, each beaker contains a solution in it, right? Each beaker is going to have a solution in it, right? Now, the convention when sketching electrochemical cells is to always put the oxidation half reaction on the left and the reduction half cell on the right, right? So that means that our manganese, so I'll just draw like a strip of metal, this, right? And I'm going to label that with the chemical symbol for manganese. So what that means is our oxidation half cell is going to have a strip of manganese submerged in a solution. And that solution is going to contain manganese Mn2 plus ions. And that's going to be at a concentration of one molar. Again, that's because we are assuming that we are dealing with standard conditions. Standard conditions for any aqueous solution is always going to be a concentration of exactly one molar, right? And so that would be our oxidation half cell. And then in the other half cell, right, that's our reduction half cell. Uh, we're going to have a strip of nickel submerged in the solution. So I will label that accordingly. So there's my little strip of nickel, right? And that solution is going to be of nickel ions, Ni2 pluses. And of course, that's going to be at a concentration of one molar. I don't know why these little blue streaks are appearing in front of the <laughs> text that I'm trying to write, but eh, whatever. So, all right. So we have each strip of metal submerged in a solution of that metal cation at a concentration of one molar, right? So, of course, we need to uh, draw these pieces of metal connected together, right, by a wire. And remember that these pieces of metal, once they're connected together, they start to act as electrodes, right? An electrode is just a conductive surface that allows electrons to enter or leave the half cell, right? And we have some fancy names for these electrodes, right? The one where oxidation is occurring, in this case, our strip of manganese, we call that the anode. The electrode where oxidation occurs, that's the anode, this strip of manganese here. And the electrode where reduction is occurring, we call that the cathode, right? 
in this case, the nickel would be our cathode, right? Now, okay, so we're almost done, right? We've labeled our anode, we've labeled our cathode. We also need to label the direction of electron flow, right? So since oxidation is occurring in the anode, that's where the electrons are being generated. And so the spontaneous flow of electrons is going to be in this direction from the anode to the cathode, right? So we've labeled the anode, we've labeled the cathode, we've labeled the direction of electron flow. And there's one more piece of this that's very, very important that we cannot neglect, and that is the salt bridge. So we are going to draw the salt bridge. So remember, the salt bridge is usually like an inverted U shaped tube that looks kind of like this. It's got these permeable stoppers, and it's got this. Uh, solution, this electrolyte solution that is suspended in a gel, right? So I'm just going to label this as my salt bridge, right? And the, the purpose of the salt bridge is to neutralize the charge buildup that takes place within the solutions in our half cell, right? In the solution of our anode, we're going to have a buildup of positive charge because electrons are constantly leaving the anode and then in the solution of the cathode, we're going to have a buildup of negative charge because electrons are constantly being supplied to the cathode, right? And so that salt bridge just allows those counter ions to come in and neutralize the charge buildup because if that charge buildup wasn't being neutralized, then the flow of electric charge would stop almost immediately, right? And so that's basically it for this one, right? So we understood how to predict the direction of spontaneity. We confirmed that this reaction is spontaneous as written. We separated it into half reactions, right? And then we just used our knowledge of oxidation and reduction and of voltaic cells to sketch this thing out, label our electrodes appropriately. And of course, we can't forget that good old trusty salt bridge. So that does it for this problem. Uh, we are going to move right along to the next one. So I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this. If anybody has any questions or anything, if you think I left something out, please, by all means, let me know. You guys are pretty quiet in the chat, so uh, hopefully we can um, hopefully we, we can change that. I want to read your feedback in real time. I think that's one of the biggest advantages of live streaming. So, all right, we're going to delete all of this. We're going to paste in uh, the next problem here. So let me uh, go ahead and fetch that for you. By the way, if you find this content valuable, I would highly appreciate your support in the form of a thumbs up. Leaving a thumbs up on this video goes a long way to help with discoverability. Uh, the way I usually put it is liking is sharing, right? So when you like something, it gets promoted just a teeny tiny bit in the algorithm. And if you've seen my numbers lately, well, I need all the help in that department that I can get. So also, if you'd like to support the stream, with your money, um, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can donate to Super Chats. Uh, that's pretty straightforward, They're like a little dollar sign at the bottom corner of the thing or whatever uh, on, your, on your phone. Or uh, you can donate through Streamlabs. There's a link in the description that says support the stream. Streamlabs, Streamlabs donations are preferable because Streamlabs takes a lesser cut than YouTube Super Chats. But again, any support that you can provide, uh, if you would like, again, if you find this content valuable, uh, would be would be greatly appreciated. So, all right, let's move on to the next problem. So this problem has the same instructions, right? We're predicting whether the reaction is spontaneous as written or if the reverse reaction is spontaneous, right? And then we are going to sketch the ele uh, electrochemical cell associated with the spontaneous redox reaction, whichever one that happens to be. And then we are going to, of course, we are going to assume standard conditions here, right? Okay. So again, the first step is to identify what's undergoing oxidation, what is undergoing reduction, and to write the half reactions for those processes accordingly. So we have our oxidation half reaction, we have our reduction half reaction. So it looks to me, and this is our equation where we have lead reacting with calcium ion to produce lead two ion and calcium, right? So it looks to me like lead is losing electrons. It looks like lead, since it goes from neutral lead the lead with a positive two charge, that's the stuff that is undergoing oxidation. So I'm going to write that half reaction where we have Pb reacts to produce Pb2 plus and two electrons. 
The reduction looks like the calcium ion is being reduced. It's gaining electrons to become neutral calcium, right? That's going to be Ca2 plus plus two electrons yields just plain old calcium, right? So now we have our oxidation and our reduction half reactions written out. We are well on our way to solving this problem. Now we have to consult the table of standard electrode potentials to determine uh, whether this will be spontaneous under standard conditions. Let's go ahead and take a look at that table. So we have the reduction of calcium ion and the oxidation of lead, right? The reduction of calcium ion and the oxidation of lead. Now, so the question is, right, does the reverse of the oxidation of lead lie below the reduction of calcium in this table. So let's find uh, the reduction of calcium ion. I don't see it anywhere. Where is it? Oh, okay, so it's pretty close to the bottom. Okay, so it's looking like this is gonna be a non-spontaneous reaction, right? So calcium ion lies close to the bottom of this table, coming in uh, with a electrode potential of minus 2.76 volts, right? And so let's see if we can locate uh, lead the oxidation of lead okay so the oxidation of lead would be the reverse of the reduction of lead ion as shown right here where my mouse cursor is right and so we can see that our reduction half reaction is being paired with the reverse of a reduction half reaction that appears above it in the table not below it and so therefore uh, this is going to be a uh, a non-spontaneous reaction right so as this reaction is written where you have lead reacting with calcium ions to produce lead ion and calcium, uh, this is not going to be spontaneous. So I'm just going to put a big fat no over here, right? Too bad. But <clears throat> the reverse of this reaction will be spontaneous, right? And so I'm going to go ahead and just erase all this stuff and just write the chemical equation for the spontaneous redox reaction, which is basically just going to be uh, this thing flipped, right? So we're going to have Pb2 plus and calcium reacting to form Pb and calcium ion, right? So everything that I've done here, I, all that I've done is I've just taken the products and I've made them the reactants and I've taken the reactants and I've made the products, right? I've reversed the equation. So since the forward reaction was non-spontaneous, then the reverse reaction will be spontaneous. And so at this point, we can rewrite our half reactions associated with this uh, spontaneous redox reaction, right? So I'll go ahead and label one for oxidation and I'll label one for reduction. So what's being oxidized in this equation? Looks like calcium is being oxidized because it's neutral at first and then it becomes positively charged. It loses electrons, right? That's going to be Ca yields Ca2 plus and two electrons, right? That's our oxidation half reaction. And then our reduction half reaction is going to be the lead ion, Pb2 plus, gaining two electrons to become just plain old lead, right? Now that we have our half reactions written out, we can begin to sketch out our voltaic cell, right? So just like the previous example, we can just draw like two beakers, right? So here's my beaker on the left. Here's my beaker on the right. And again, <clears throat> the convention is to write the or sketch the oxidation half reaction on the on the left and the reduction half reaction on the right. So that means my strip of calcium is going to be submerged in the solution on the left. So I'll label that as the chemical symbol for calcium, Ca. Um, I don't know why the gray is appearing above. I don't know what's going on. That, that should say calcium. <laughs> that should say Ca, right? And then over here on the other side, that's where our reduction is occurring. So that's going to be, that's going to have a strip of lead in it, right? So I'll go ahead and label that uh, accordingly, right? And so we also have uh, these metals that are submerged in these solutions, right? We'll go ahead and fill that in like that, right? And so the solution that is going to be in the calcium half cell is going to be calcium ion, Ca2+, and that's going to be at a concentration of one 
molar since we're dealing with standard conditions, right? And the same thing for the lead, it's going to be PB2+, plus, and that's going to be at a concentration of 1 molar, right? And so we can draw these electrodes now as uh, connected together by a wire, right? We'll go ahead and label our anode and our cathode. The anode in this case is going to be that calcium strip, right? Because the anode is the electrode where the oxidation is occurring, right? And our cathode, by contrast, is going to be the strip of lead in this particular voltaic cell, right? We have our anode, we have our cathode, both of them are labeled. The direction of electron flow is always going to be from anode to cathode. Electrons are going to spontaneously flow out of that strip of calcium and into that strip of lead. So we have the flow of electrons, we have the anode, we have the cathode, everything is labeled. Uh, the last thing that we need to do in order to sketch a valid operational functional voltaic cell is to draw our salt bridge, right? That's going to be this inverted U-shaped tube. I'll just go ahead and label that as the salt bridge. <coughs> and again, that all that does is that just allows ions to come in to neutralize the charge buildup that occurs in the solution. So uh, Rohan asks, for the salt bridge, is it safe to assume that KNO3 will usually be the substance inside of it, or is there any other common salt bridge substances? Yeah, I think really the only requirement for the salt bridge is that it's uh, a strong electrolyte. I think that's really it. I mean, potassium nitrate is a, is a good example of one. Um, good question, though. You know, to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of, like, hands-on direct experience with electrochemistry, so I'm happy to look up to see what common substances are used as, uh, as the electrolyte within a salt bridge. Good question. You kind of stumped me on that. I'll, I'll just be honest with you there. <laughs> All right, so that takes care of that problem. Uh, we have a couple more to go before we're all wrapped up. So I'm going to go ahead and delete everything here. And we are going to move on. We're going to take a look at the next one. Next one, a little bit more complicated, I think. Let's see, yeah, next one's going to be a little bit more complicated. But we will get through it, and I will explain everything. Here we go. Rohan says, also, regarding the electron flow, does it matter if we write electron versus two electron, since the problem has two electron transfer? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's two electrons per equivalent of each ion, but I don't really think that matters much. All I was trying to indicate is which direction electrons were flowing, uh, not how many are transferred per one increment of the, of the reaction occurring. Uh, so that's really all I was aiming for. You might have a professor or something that you know, wants to see the two electrons, but um, I've never heard of that, so I don't know. All right, so let's move on with this problem here. So this problem, again, it's the same instructions, right? For predicting the, the direction of spontaneity for this redox reaction, whether it's spontaneous in the forward or the reverse direction, uh, then we are going to sketch the voltaic cell associated with whichever one of the reactions forward or reverse happens to be spontaneous. And then, of course, we're gonna assume uh, that we're dealing with standard conditions here, right? So the, re the equation looks like this, where we have uh, diatomic fluorine reacting with copper uh, to produce two chloride ions and a copper two plus ion, right? So just like the last two examples, uh, in this example, we're going to label our oxidation and our reduction half reactions. We're going to identify what's being uh, oxidized what's being reduced. Looks to me like the copper is losing electrons. It's undergoing oxidation. It's being oxidized. So I'll go ahead and write out that reaction. So that's going to be copper reacting to form copper two plus ion and two electrons, right? And at the same time, it looks like chlorine, Cl2, is undergoing uh, reduction. So that's going to be Cl2 plus two electrons produce two Cl minus chloride ion, right? So we have the reduction of chlorine. We have the 
oxidation of copper, right? So at this point, what we need to do is we need to take a look at that table of standard electrode potentials, figure out whether the reverse of the oxidation of, of uh, copper appears below the reduction of chlorine in that table. So let's take a look at that table real quick. So let's see if we can find the reduction of chlorine in this table. Where's that gonna be? Not seeing it. Oh, here it is right here. So right here where my mouse cursor is. We have Cl2 plus two electrons yields two chloride ions. Coming in with a value of 1.36 for the electrode potential, standard electrode potential, right? And so the question is, does the reverse of the oxidation of copper appear below this reduction half reaction for the reduction of chlorine, right? So we have to locate copper in this table here. And it looks like, so this is a little bit confusing because there's two different ones, right? So we have to make sure that we choose the one that applies in our situation. So this one is Cu2 plus plus two, two electrons. That's the correct one. There's also another one up here where it's just Cu plus copper one ion. Uh, that doesn't apply to what we're talking about. But in either case, yes, it does look like the oxidation or the reverse of the oxidation of copper appears below the reduction of chlorine in this table. And so therefore, this will be a spontaneous uh, redox reaction, right? So I'm just going to draw a big fat yes, it is spontaneous in the forward direction, right? So we don't need to flip this equation in order to get a voltaic cell, right? This voltaic cell will work. You will have a transfer of electrons from your anode to your cathode if you hook it up as written by this redox reaction, right? So at this point, I mean, we can go ahead and start sketching the cell, right? So again, I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw my two beakers, right? One on the left-hand side. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger, actually. One beaker on the left-hand side, uh, one beaker on the right-hand side, right? There's going to be uh, a strip of metal submerged in the oxidation half cell. Remember the oxidation half cell? We always do that one on the left and the reduction on the right. We're going to have a strip of copper. Now let me draw that on the other side so I can make room for the salt bridge later. We're going to have a strip of copper, right? And that's going to be submerged in a solution. And in that solution, we will have our copper ions, Cu two pluses. And again, since we're at standard conditions, it'll be at a concentration of exactly one molar. Now, let's take a look at the chlorine uh, reduction half reaction. So this is kind of a problem for us because like chlorine is a gas. It's not a metal. So chlorine cannot, you can't have like a strip of chlorine placed in a solution of chlorine ion. It doesn't work that way because chlorine is not solid. It can't function as an electrode. And so what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to use an inert electrode. We're going to have to use an electrode that does not participate in the redox reaction, but it still acts as a conductive surface that allows electrons to enter or leave. In this case, it would be enter uh, the half cell, right? So we're still going to have a solution of fluoride ions. So we're going to have Cl minus ions in there at a concentration of one a molar, but we have to use some inert metal as our electrode. Usually platinum is a pretty good choice for that. So I'll write PT. Again, I don't know why my black markings are appearing behind my gray ones, but there's my symbol for PT. So we have an inert electrode, uh, but then we, we still have to be able to, to put chlorine into this to in order to be reduced uh, into chloride ion uh, to get this voltaic cell to work. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to draw like an inverted tube with a sidearm on it, right? And so the chlorine gas, the Cl2, is going to go in here, and it'll be bubbled through this solution, right? So whenever you have one of your reactants in the gas phase, that's how you would do it. And since this is under standard conditions, the pressure of that gas that's being bubbled through that solution is going to be exactly one atmosphere, right? Anytime you have a gas, the standard condition for that gas, the standard pressure is going to be 
one atmosphere, right? And so this would be our inert platinum electrode here uh, that allows the flow of electrons to take place, right? And so we connect these two electrodes together, right? One of them is going to be our anode. One of them is going to be our cathode. Anode, that's the one where oxidation is occurring. In this case, that would be the copper, right? Cathode, that is the electrode where reduction is occurring. In this case, that's the inert platinum electrode <coughs> in our reduction half reaction, right? And then at this point, the only thing we need to do is to include our salt bridge. So I'll just draw that here. It's going to be submerged in the solution. And I'll just go ahead and label that as salt bridge. I'll just do salt B for short because I don't think I have enough space here to write the entire word of bridge out. Uh, oh, and then we can also indicate the, the direction of the flow of electrons. Of course, it's going to be from the copper to the inert platinum electrode that's uh, associated with this reduction of chlorine uh, half reaction, right? This half cell. Uh, Roberto asks, do the hydrogen cell cars work on something similar as the chlorine gas example? We are actually going to talk about that in a future live stream. Um, so stay tuned because we will actually talk about hydrogen, oxygen, fuel cells and stuff. So very, very exciting. stuff. Thank you for your question. So, all right. So that is that pretty much does it for that problem. So we can move on. We got a couple more to go, and then we will uh, we'll be done. So again, the whole purpose of this is I just wanted to do some practice because I've been criticized on my lack of practice in the past. You know, going over a concept and then just going over like one or two practice problems and then immediately moving on without really having an opportunity to digest all the material uh, that we've just discussed. So I really, really want to avoid that kind of criticism going forward. I don't want to avoid criticism. I, I do want to be criticized, but uh, I want to be able to like address and, you know, uh, improve um, as a result of getting that criticism. So here we go. I'm going to move on to another uh, problem. Let me uh, go ahead and paste that in the whiteboard for you. I hope this stream has been valuable. I really, really do. And I also would hope that if it wasn't, that you would let me know. Here we go. All right, so here's the problem. Okay, so this says to sketch out the voltaic cell represented by the line notation below and to calculate the standard cell potential, the E cell degree sign, right? So this is that electrochemical cell notation. This is that line notation. So remember that the way that these are written is as follows, where we have the uh, that's not a good mark. Let me try that again. <laughs> so we're going to have the oxidation half cell always going to be written on the left, and the reduction half cell is always going to be written on the right. Okay, and the there's always a double vertical bar that sort of indicates the salt bridge. It just separates the two half cells, right? It separates the oxidation half cell from the reduction half cell. And the notation is also written such that substances that are in different phases are separated by a single uh, vertical bar. So we can see that we have solid chromium and aqueous chromium ion here separated by a vertical bar. Similarly, similarly we have gold three ion aqueous separated with a vertical bar from the solid gold here, right? And then if there were substances that were in the same phase that were participating in the reaction, they would be separated by commas, uh, but that does not apply to this particular voltaic cell, right? So again, first thing we're going to do is we're just going to look up our oxidation and our reduction uh, half reactions. We're just going to identify them and write them out. It's always a useful, productive exercise to do that, in my opinion. So we have one for oxidation. We have one for uh, reduction, right? So oxidation, that's kind of a dead giveaway. It's always on the left. So that's going to be chromium reacting to form chromium 3 plus ion and three electrons. And then for reduction, that's going to be the gold 3 plus ion gaining three electrons to form just plain old gold, right? 
And so as far as sketching the voltaic cell is concerned, again, at this point, we've probably recognized the pattern. And so this is pretty, pretty easy, but I think it's, again, really, really important and really useful to like improve your understanding of the material by sketching these things out. I really, really think thick in your mind. We'll go ahead and draw this out. So we have a beaker, have another beaker, right? So uh, we're going to have chromium going to be on our left. So there's my little strip of chromium right there. And then on the right, we're going to have our gold. So let me change this to like a nice gold color there. Gold or is that brown? I can't tell. I'll just use yellow. This is going to be my strip of gold, right? This is a very expensive electrochemical cell to have gold, right? <laughs> so all right, and so of course each of these is going to be submerged in a solution. The solution in our oxidation half cell is going to be Cr3 plus ions, concentration of one molar. For our reduction half cell, it's going to be Au3 plus ions, also at a concentration of one molar, right? So we're going to uh, draw these as if they are connected together. Uh, we're going to have a salt bridge also in there. Right, label that SB for salt bridge. Right, we know that our anode that's the oxidation where that's the oxidation, uh, that's the electrode where oxidation is occurring. Uh, we know that our cathode that is our electrode where the reduction is occurring. So the anode is the chromium, cathode is the gold. We know that the electrons in a voltaic cell are going to flow from the anode to the cathode. Right, so there's our sketch. Right. But this problem asks us to take a step further, right? We're asked to calculate the value of the standard cell potential, right? And there's a formula that's going to help us to calculate the standard cell potential. Let me zoom out so I could just give myself uh, a bit more room here, right? So there's a formula that's going to allow us to calculate uh, the standard cell potential. And that formula is as follows, where we have the standard cell potential, E cell is going to be equal to the electrode potential of our cathode minus the electrode potential of our anode, right? And so now we have to look up those values in the table of standard electrode potentials, and that'll help us to solve this problem, right? So I'll go ahead and write E cathode is equal to something, then E or our anode is equal to something else. So join me as I look these up in the table of standard electrode potentials. So we have the reduction of gold ion and we have the oxidation of chromium. So I think I can remember that. So let's see if we can find the reduction of gold ion. Looks like it's right here. It has a value of 1.50 volts, positive 1.50 volts. So I'll go back to the right the whiteboard real quick. So that's our cathode, right? 1.50 volts. And then if we do the same thing for our anode, again, that's the oxidation of chromium. So the reduction half reaction would be the reduction of chromium ion, right? So let's see if we can find that anywhere in this table. Looks like I've located it. It's right here, and it has a value of minus 0 0.73 volts. So minus 0 0.73 volts, right? Go back to the whiteboard, full window here. Okay, so at this point, all we have to do is just plug these numbers into the formula, right? So our value of our standard cell potential is going to be the electrode potential of our cathode, that's 1.50 volts, minus negative 0.73 volts, the standard electrode potential of our anode, right? And so if you plug this into your calculator, which I would highly recommend that you do, uh, you are going to get a value for your standard cell potential of 2.23 volts, positive 2.23 volts, right? 
since the value of our standard cell potential is positive, that means that this is a functional voltaic cell. This is a spontaneous redox reaction. Electrons will spontaneously flow from the anode chromium to the cathode, which is the gold. All right, so we're going to do one more problem, I think, and then we will be done for the night, and we'll be, we'll be on our way to having a wonderful week coming up this week. I wish that for everybody watching this and for everybody not watching. Let me grab the last problem in here. Going to be a good one, I think. Here we go. All right. So it's the same instructions as the previous problem. We're going to sketch the voltaic cell that's represented by the cell that's shown in this line notation. We're going to sketch that voltaic cell, and we're also going to calculate the value of our standard cell potential, right? So again, these things are written such that the oxidation half reaction is on the left, and the reduction half reaction or the reduction half cell is on the right. So for our oxidation half reaction, that's going to be a pretty straightforward, right? We're going to have manganese going to react to form manganese 2 plus and two electrons, right? For a reduction, it's a little less straightforward, right? Because we have this platinum over here. And whenever you have platinum over here, that just means the platinum is acting as an inert electrode. It's not participating in redox. Um, it's just acting as an electrode that allows electrons to come into the half cell or leave the half cell, right? So really, it's the ClO2, the chlorine dioxide, and the chlorine dioxide anion uh, that are the, the active species uh, in this particular half reaction, right? The reduction is going to be ClO2, the chlorine dioxide, plus an electron uh, is going to give us the chlorine dioxide anion. ClO2 minus, right? So we have our oxidation and reduction half reactions written out. So that means uh, we can go ahead and sketch the cell. Before I do that, I just want to tidy things up a little bit. I want to take this, see if I can move it up a little closer because I'm going to need some room a little later. Do that and then I'll zoom out a little bit. That always helps to create room, right? All right. So we have our half reactions written out. Now we can sketch our voltaic cell. So I'll draw my two beakers here, one beaker there, and one beaker there. So beaker on the left, that's going to have our oxidation half cell. So that means that that's going to be uh, the manganese that goes in there. Let me gray color here. Uh, so that's going to be our manganese, label that accordingly, right? And that manganese is going to be submerged in a solution. In that solution, we will have the manganese 2 plus ions at a concentration of 1 molar, right? So that takes care of the oxidation half cell. And then in our reduction half cell, what's that going to look like? Well, of course, our Chlorine dioxide anion is aqueous, and our uh, chlorine dioxide is a gas, right? Neither of those two are solid, so neither of those two can act as an electron here. That's what's going to act as our electrode. So I'll just label that accordingly. So it's going to be a strip of platinum that's in there, E, right? And then that's going to be submerged in a solution. What is going to be in the solution? Well, it's going to be the stuff that's labeled as aqueous, which in this case is the ClO2 minus anion, right? So it's going to be ClO2 minus, and that's going to be at a concentration of one molar, of course, because we're dealing with standard conditions here, right? And then the chlorine dioxide, right? Since that's a gas, we're going to use that inverted tube sort of thing with the sidearm, right? This is a, a really wonky looking tube, but. I'll just roll with it. Uh, and that's going to allow us to put chlorine, Cl, or not chlorine, but chlorine dioxide, ClO2. Uh, that's going to go in there. And that's going to be at a pressure of one atmosphere. Again, since we're talking about 
standard conditions. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so we can see a little bit better here. I mean, we already have our half reactions. Let me grab this whole thing and just bring it and get a better, better view of what's going on here. Okay, so M didn't make it. All right, so this is what our uh, electrodes would look like. Okay, so we would connect them together, right? In this case, our manganese, that's where oxidation is occurring, so that's going to be our anode, right? The platinum, the inert platinum electrode in this fluorine dioxide reduction half cell, that's going to be our cathode, that's where reduction is occurring, right? Last but certainly not least, we have to include our salt bridge. So go ahead and label that SB. We know that the electrons are going to flow from the anode to the cathode, right? Flow of electrons is going to look like that. And that is basically the sketch of our voltaic cell. So we sketched out the voltaic cell. The last thing that this problem is asking us to do, calculate the standard cell potential. So in order to do that, we need to look up the electrode potentials, the standard electrode potentials of each of these half reactions in the table of standard electrode potentials. So let's go ahead and do that. So we have the reduction of chlorine dioxide. We have the oxidation of manganese. Let's go ahead and pull up that table and we can locate our half reactions, right? So the half reaction for reduction is, again, it's the reduction of chlorine dioxide. I've located it right here. That has a standard electrode potential of positive 0 0.95 volts. We can go ahead and uh, write that in, right? So I'll uh, write these in. So we're going to have the standard electrode potential of our cathode and the standard electrode potential of our anode. In this case, the cathode, that's the one where the uh, chlorine dioxide is being reduced, right? So what did we say? Already forgot it. 0 0.95, something like that. Yeah, 0 0.95 volts. Let's go ahead and my whiteboard. There we go. Uh, so that's 0 0.95 volts, right? So let's look up our anode, right? Our anode is going to be the oxidation of manganese. So in this table, what we're looking for is the uh, reduction of the manganese 2 plus ion. That looks like it is down here. And that comes in with a value of minus 1.18 volts, right? That's a value of minus 1.18 volts, okay? Let me go back to the actual uh, whiteboard here. Looks like I'm off the page, so let me zoom out just a little bit. And bring that in focus, okay. All right, so we have the electrode potentials, the standard electrode potentials of both our cathode and our anode, right? So in order to calculate this, we need to use that handy dandy formula where we have the standard cell potential is equal to standard electrode potential of our cathode minus the standard electrode potential of our anode, right? And so now we just got to plug these numbers in and, and calculate the cell potential, right? So it's going to be 0 0.95 volts. That's the standard electrode potential of our cathode minus negative 1.18 volts. That's standard electrode potential for our anode. And if you throw this in your calculator and solve this, which I highly, highly recommend doing, uh, you will get a value of positive 2.13 volts, right? And of course, since it's positive, that means this is a spontaneous redox reaction and that a voltaic cell configured in just this way uh, will work. There will be a spontaneous flow of electrons from the manganese to that platinum electrode where the reduction of chlorine dioxide is occurring. So, all right, everyone, that is just about going to do it. Let me cut that off. Yeah, that's just about going to do it. So I hope that this these exercises uh, have been helpful. Um, like I said before, I've been criticized in the past for not doing enough practice for going over a complicated concept and then only doing like one problem on it and then just going on to some other complicated concept. Uh, so I want to avoid 
making that mistake going forward. So again, I hope this was productive for you. I hope it was helpful. Um, next week, not sure if I'm going to be able to go live or not. I am going out of town to visit family. Not sure if I'm going to be able to have the time to prepare for a stream or to have the time to like, you know, get back in time to go live. So kind of open-ended, not sure whether it's going to happen or not, but if it does happen, it will be uh, next Sunday. What is that going to be the 20th? Let me double check that just to make sure so I don't sound like an idiot. Uh, yeah, so it'll be next Sunday, uh, March 20th. It'll be 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Here in the United States, we have just recently, as of this morning, switched from standard time to daylight savings time. Uh, so we have set our clocks forward by an hour. So in terms of like time zones compared to like UTC, um, I used to be in UTC minus five, but for the next six months, I will be in UTC minus four hours. So for those of you who maybe don't live in the United States and you'd like to follow along. So yeah, it's nine o'clock PM in the UTC minus four time zone. Uh, that is when I'm going to go live. And uh, I really hope to see you guys then. So, all right. Love you guys. Take care.